uh, jump into the chalk everywhere. That's why I can't have anything nice. Um, so, all right. So today we're going to talk about database compression. So um, we'll sort of jump right in, get into it. So we'll talk at the beginning a little bit about uh, you know why database compression is important. I mean, it's sort of obvious, but we can talk a little bit about the, the trade-offs and the issues you can face with it. And then we'll talk about using what I'll call a naive compression or general purpose compression. And this is sort of related to what one of the, pro the groups presented on, on Monday. Uh, and I sort of you know, stopped and said, no, you don't want to do this. might be a bad idea. So we'll talk about how, how you know, why and what are the implications of doing, doing naive compression. And then we'll suppose, spend most of our time doing, uh, talking about columnar compression in OLAP systems because this is where you get the most bang for the buck, right? And this is where we can actually take, have the database system be written in such a way that it can operate and execute, execute queries directly on compressed data without having to decompress it at all, which was what the naive thing uh, has a limitation for. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking actually about research here going on at CMU doing compression on OLTP indexes. Um, and that is actually not published yet, but we, I'll give you a preview of how it works and look at some early numbers. Okay? And as always, stop me if you have questions as we go along. So if you think about it in the old days, when, well, not old days, I guess disk-based dis systems are still around, but uh, the, in, in a disk-oriented system, the disk is always going to be the major bottleneck, right? It's, even if you have a flash drive, it's still going to be orders of magnitude slower than you know, reading and writing from DRAM. So in a traditional disk-oriented system, uh, they, are, they make the big trade-off that we're willing to pay CPU cycles in order to reduce the amount of I.O. we have to do getting data from disk. Right? So you think about also, too, like when you see those, those graphs of like, you know, CPU speeds and Moore's law and number of transistors, right? there's always that exponential growth of the, the, the performance of CPUs. And then if you pair that together with the, the, the read and write speed, the latencies of accessing you know, a, a spinning disk hard drive or an SSD, that's always much flatter, right? So the, the, the CPUs have gotten so much faster over the years and disks haven't really kept up. So now they have all these cycles and what are we gonna do with it? Well, we'll compress things, right? And that way we, we reduce the amount of I.O. we have to do. In an in-memory database system, it's a little more complicated because we don't have a disk anymore, right? Reading things from DRAM is really, really fast, right? Despite what we talked about, you know, uh, you know, making sure we have things in L3 cache, still going to DRAM is, you know, orders of magnitude faster than going, going to disk. So maybe we don't want to pay that big penalty of having to do comp uh, computationally expensive compression um, for our data. Well, it turns out actually, in, in, in the end, you actually do want to do this, uh, and we'll talk about reasons why as we go along. Uh, but in general, um, the reason why it's important to do compression also in an in-memory database is, is the obviously because you can store more things in memory that way, right? DRAM is very expensive, uh, not only to buy and have in your system, but also to actually maintain in your hardware or in your, in your, in your server, right? The energy cost of, of, a, of a, you know, uh, you know general-purpose rack machine, uh, the energy usage, about 40% goes to just refreshing DRAM. So if you have fewer machines that have less, you know, you can use less DRAM to store your database because you compress things, then you end up paying, you know, less energy and have to buy less machines. So that's important. But the key trade-off that we're always going to make in, when we talk about compression algorithms, is going to be speed versus compression ratio, right? So, you, so in a database system, as far as I know, every single, uh, you know, database system that does compression, and especially in in-memory database systems, they're always going to choose speed over, over compression ratio, right? Because it, it just makes, you know, your queries need to run, you're fast, your transactions need to run fast. So we're, we're willing to give up some extra compression that we could get if we were doing things with a more computation expensive approach in order to get faster, uh, faster computation times for queries. So there's, we need to talk a little bit about what real data looks like uh, to understand why compression actually makes sense and, and is going to work for us. So in general, real world databases have two key characteristics that we're going to want to exploit uh, in our compression scheme. The first is that the data sets or the values in, our, in, our, in these databases tend to be really, really skewed, right? So that means that they're, they, f f the cardinality of the values for a particular attribute is going to be skewed such that most of them are going to have the same value, 
right? And an example of this would be like the Zipian distribution, the parallel distribution of the brown corpus. Does anyone know what the brown corpus is? What is that? You shake your head, yes? Right, well, well what is it? Right, so it's like in the 1960s at Brown, they came up with a bunch of, uh, they, they handpicked a bunch of documents that had a, that they considered to be re uh, emblematic, representative of American English. And then someone went along and counted all the different words that are in the corpus, and they found out that the word that occurs the most is the word the. And then the second word that occurs, the, the second most, occurs half as many times as the first word. And then likewise going on, right? you get an exponential curve. So that means that, again, that there's, if you were building an index or, or storing the brown corpus, you would want to compress uh, the word the in, in, a, in, a, in an efficient way because that's going to occur more than anything else, right? And you get the most savings that way. And this occurs all the time when you think of like internet applications, right? On eBay, there's, you know, a small number of sellers post the most auctions. Uh, on like Reddit, a small number of users post the most comments and, and articles and things like that. So there's a lot of skew in our, in our, in our, in our data sets and we want to exploit that. The second is that we have, uh, we're going to have a lot of high correlation between different attributes uh, within the same tuple. And we can try to exploit that in, in different ways. So what I mean by that is like the value of one particular attribute is going to be some way connected to the value of another attribute. So for example, if you have like uh, an address table and you have the person's you know, street address, their zip code in the city, well, if you know their zip code, then you probably also know their, you actually do know their city, right? So these two values are always going to be, you know, if given one value, you know the other one. Same thing of like, if you have like the order date of when someone purchased something on Amazon, the date that they sh it was get shipped is usually within, within the next week, right? It's not going to be some arbitrary, you know, timestamp and way in the future. So these are the kind of things we want to be able to exploit when we do compression in our database. These are things we want to be mindful of. So the two key things, or two main goals we need to have in a good database compression scheme is that we obviously need to, need to have, always be able to produce fixed length values, right? If we have these variable length values, then we can't do that uh, you know, word aligning the stuff that we talked about when we were packing and things in, uh, in memory. Uh, then we have to worry about fragmentation in our memory allocator. So it's always easier for us to make sure that our compression scheme will produce fixed length values. The second major goal is that we want to be able to postpone for as long as possible during query execution having to decompress the data. So again, not to harp on the guys on Monday, they talked about having to, you, you compress a block and then when you want to access it, you decompress it every time. Right? And you need to decompress it as soon as you access it because you don't know what's actually inside of it. But with the other compression schemes that we'll talk about here, we can actually go pretty far up in the uh, query plan tree, just operating directly on compressed values. And it's only when we have to return a value back to, to the application do we then invoke the decompression uh, protocol to, to put it back into its original form. Right? And the advantage of that is that now we're passing around fewer, fewer, fewer bits and fewer bytes from one operator to, to the next, because it can still be in the compressed form. So these are the, these are the two major goals we, we want to have and we want to support for all our compression schemes. Uh, we're going to talk about compression. I mean, we have to talk about lossy versus lossless. I mean, everyone pretty much here should, should understand the difference. But the main idea is like if you have a lossless compression scheme, basically when you compress the data and decompress it, you get back the original, the original value. Right? So anything like you know, gzip on, on Linux is an example of a lossless scheme. A lossy scheme would be one where you compress the data and then you decompress it and some of the original data will, will, will be gone because it got thrown away during the compression process. The easiest one to think about this is like MP, or MP3s and you know, on the video uh, compression schemes or you know, JPEG. And so in a database system, we're always going to do lossless compression. We can never want to do this because if we do a lossless, lossy compression and we compress their data that somebody doesn't know we're doing this, then they go to access it, I mean, they, then now their data is missing, they would get pissed and think their database is, is doing something wrong. Right? So this is why every single database scheme that's, or every database system that's going to do compression always does lossless because you don't want, because it's sort of this higher level meaning to understand what, is it, what does it mean to lose data and still be okay, that's something that the database system can't figure out. So anytime you do lossy compression, it always is done by the application programmer. So you see this a lot in like time series databases, right? Say they're collecting a, a, a new measurement from a sensor every minute. Well, maybe you don't need that, that 
that one minute granularity from last year's data. So you'll combine it together and take an average for every five minutes or every 10 minutes or something like that. Right, that's an example of lossy compression, but that's something that you as the application programmer have to, have to implement. There are some database systems, newer ones, that can support approximate queries, which are sort of like lossy compression. Um, but the data itself is still stored in a lossless compression scheme. But what happens is they do sampling to generate query results without having to look at all the data. Right? And for most of the times, this, 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 is not a, this is not a big deal. Right? If you want to know what the average sale price of you know, 10 million items you sold, if you only look at 9 million, it's still going to be pretty close to, to the, the full value. So BlinkDB is, is probably the key one system that does this kind of thing. And actually, they, I, just, I think they just forked off a commercial version of this uh, a few weeks ago called Snappy Data. Um, but again, they're still doing lossless compression, but it's sort of like a lossy scheme when they, when they actually execute the queries, which I think is kind of cool. OK, so we also need to talk about what the granularity of our compression scheme is going to be. Um, so the, the different database systems are going to do different things. Um, and some of these different granulators are going to be better than others. So like block level would be sort of like you take a single block, you compress it in some way, and that's the sort of scope of it. And every block is compressed individually from all other blocks. Uh, tuple level, we take the contents of the entire tuple and compress it. Attribute level would be sort of like take a single attribute within, within like a field within one tuple. Um, you can combine this to have multiple attributes together. And then column level is what we're mostly going to talk about, is sort of taking all the values within a column on a single table. And you can still break that up even more, maybe into individual blocks. Uh, but you're looking at sort of uh, attributes contiguously one after another. Um, for this one, you're going to have to require to, you, to use a column store. Um, to have, doing this in a row store doesn't really make sense, and, and it, you, you couldn't quite do it. Um, there's also, in like a disk-based data system, you can do sort of file level granularity or, or, or table level granularity. Um, this doesn't really, it's usually not a good idea because if you ever have to update the table, you may have to decompress the entire thing and that can get really expensive. In the case of file level compression, it's usually done at like the storage layer, like your, your file system could, or, or your NAS or SAN that you're using to store the database could do the compression for you underneath the covers and hardware. Okay, so now let's talk about, yes. So column level would be like, um, attribute level would be take one tuple, take one, one actual attribute, and compress it. So Postgres does this. So if you have like a var char that doesn't fit in line, they can store it in this thing called toast, or this toast storage, and that can be like compressed using like naive compression, right? Column level is like taking all the values with, the, with a single column, right? Yes. Like, for example, like, a, like an address has like numbers in it and a street name. Yeah, so you, you can do things like say if you have it's. I mean, it's sort of like I don't get in the bit packing it. Like, it's sort of like attribute level, right? You can go with even more finer grain granularity, but again, you I think you sacrifice performance because um, uh, you need to be more careful about like how you unpack it as you need it, right? Most of the times in like OLTP, actually most times most of the queries, you need the whole, you need the whole attribute, right, the value. Right? You can do like an inverted index to do text search to get at one particular element of an attribute, uh, but that's, that's separate from compression. Um, yeah, that's, I would, I would lump it in this. Um, did you have another question or no? no. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, the Postgres is an example of, of this, right? You can you just take the var char or, or var blob, you compress it somewhere else. Okay. All right, so so naive compression. Uh, the basic idea of this is that the the, the we're going to treat the whatever it is we're compressing uh, as sort of like a black box, where a compression scheme that just takes some input in, crunches it, and then spits out the output, and that's what we store uh, over top of where the original data was. Um, so the, the examples of compression algorithms that you use for doing naive compression are LZO, LZ4, and Snappy. These are sort of the, the main ones. So these are different than like the, uh, the, the GZIP algorithms or the BZIP because 
These algorithms are designed to be very fast in exchange for giving up uh, you know, better compression ratio. So LZO was sort of the first one used, came out in the 1990s. Um, and then LZ4 is, is the successor of LZO. And Snappy is Google's open source compression algorithm. Uh, sort of, I think it's in the, sort of the same family of these LZ algorithms. Um, where again, but the, these are designed to be for use for databases as you update things or as, as you're accessing things. Right, so they're going to make, they make the sacrifice of giving up compression um, uh, compression ratio in exchange for not having you know, spend a lot of CPU cycles to do this. Right, so again, so what's going to happen here is we're just again, we're taking the raw bits or bytes of our data, we throw it through this algorithm, and then we, we, we store it, whatever the compressed version of it is, back in our, our table space or heap. Um, and any time we need to access it, potentially we have to unzip the whole thing. Right? We have no way to know what, actually what was inside of it. So in general, there's I, I, not in general. I think it just there's always basically two types of algorithms you can have to do naive compression, right? So the 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 first is called entropy encoding. So this is an example of like Hoffman codes if you're familiar if you remember them from like you know intro CS. And the basic idea is, is that for the more common sequences of data, like data segments within within which the thing you're compressing, you're going to use less bits to encode that, and then the more rare or the less common segments of data, you can use more bits, right? So again, Hoffman coding is, is, is the classic example of this. Dictionary coding is actually very familiar or similar to what we've already talked about with the SQL Server columnar indexes, because that was doing dictionary coding. We'll talk about dictionary coding compression in, in later on this lecture. The basic idea is the same thing, right? You're going to find uh, repeated segments of data and store them in some kind of dictionary lookup table and assign them a, a, a prefix code or a code. And then you use that code to overwrite the original value, so then you're using less data to, to, to store things than you normally would if you store the whole original value. Right? So the, the, all the algorithms that I just talked about are all examples of, of, of dictionary coding. But again, the difference is that the compression scheme is a black box to the database system. I put some bytes in, I got some bytes out. Even though it's doing, doing dictionary encoding underneath the covers, the database system doesn't know what the original values are. It doesn't have access to the dictionary, right? So you have to decompress the whole thing. Whereas if the database system implements dictionary encoding itself, it can maintain the dictionary as, as, a, as an index for, to look up and can do some query processing directly on the dictionary without having to decompress the original values, right? So this is the difference between dictionary encoding using naive compression and dictionary encoding using so the, the, the native database Im Im implementation. So I'm going to show you an example of how uh, block-based naive compression works in, in MySQL. So I think in MySQL 5.5, they announced that now they can do block-level compression or page compression in MySQL's InnoDB storage engine. So the way it works is that on disk, we have our pages, and they're always going to be stored compressed. And a compressed page is going to be roughly, where it has to be either 1, 2, 4, or 8 kilobytes. Right? So that means what happens is like if you if you start compressing your, your, your page and you go just a little bit over one kilobyte, then it'll always pad it out to be two kilobytes. Right? And this is what this ensures that you have sort of these fixed length sizes and it makes it easier to, to, to manage their, their, their location. And then for each compressed page, it's going to be appended with a what I'll call a modification log. And what this is going to be is going to allow it's a place to store updates to the data that's in the page without having to decompress it first. Right? So I'll, I'll show what this looks like in a second. So when we have a query that will, say it wants to access page zero, we'll copy it from disk and bring it into memory, and we'll always be still in its compressed form. So now any time that a transaction wants to modify this page, we would append it to this modification log. And we can do this without having to know what the actual value is. Because again, there'll be some other index that we're going to look up and say we want to find uh, you know, tuple five, and tuple five is going to be in page zero at offset six and we want to update its fifth attribute. So all we need to do is put that information into the modification log. Now if any other transaction wants to read that particular tuple we modified, it goes to this page, checks to see the, the mod log, to see whether it, that tuple's information is in there, and if so, it can just reuse it without having to decompress it again. But now if, say, the query wants to access the entire tuple, wants to read it, then we have to uncompress it. Right? And an uncompressed page is always going to be 16 kilobytes. Right, so we've been going from 1, 2 to 4 to 8 kilobytes, and then when it expands, then it becomes 16 kilobytes, and then we apply the mod log uh, to the to changes to the page here. 
So what happens is that MySQL doesn't throw away the compressed page. It always has to keep both of them. As you either keep the compressed version and the uncompressed version, or only the compressed version. And then what happens is, if it, if it has to decide, all right, I need to evict space, I need to get rid of this page, it can then recompress it and store it back, in, in back here. And then eventually, if it, if it realizes it doesn't need this page anymore, any, at all anymore, it just throws it away. I see the key thing again here is, if I had to read the tuple, I have to compress the entire thing. If I just have to update it, I can keep uh, applying updates to the mod log until it gets full, and then I have to open it back up and, and apply the changes. So this is an example of doing block level naive compression. Yes? So your question is, what happens if the, the mod log overflows? Yeah. Then you have to uncompress it, and then pack, you know, uncompress it, apply the mod log changes, and pack it again. And, pack it again. and not like, uh, I'll allow the mod log to go from 2 to 4. Uh, so his question is, like, could you have the, could. Like just pack the mod log instead of the. I, I, don't, know, I, don't, don't, I don't know what they actually do. Um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. But yeah, I don't think it matters. Um, OK. But again, so the, the main thing here, again, remember is that if, if we have to read it, we always have to decompress it. Right? And potentially, if we want to modify it, we have to decompress it as well. Right? We, we try to use the mod log, but if it, gets too, if it gets full, then we have to do something else. So, the problem with this is that it's going to limit the scope of the compression scheme. So the, what I mean by that is we can only compress a single page or a single block of data. And so that means that we may not be getting the best compression ratio because the number of unique values or the number of repeated values within a single page might be kind of low. Whereas let's say we compress the entire table, then surely we're going to have more repeated values and we get an even better compression ratio. Um, the another interesting, again, another key thing is that again, there's nothing in a database system that's that's that there's nothing in the in the compressed data that can, the database system can exploit to find a higher level meaning about what's actually in that data or the semantics of it that it can then use for query processing uh, without having to decompress it. So to give an example of this, unless you maybe pre-compute like an average or a, you know min and max or something in the page. There's, you have to decompress the entire thing to order to compute that aggregate. Whereas in some of the compression schemes we'll talk about later on, you can compute some of these aggregate fit queries without having to decompress anything. Like if you want to do a count on it, for example, if I have you know, 10 compressed items, I don't need to decompress them to count them. I can just count the compressed items. Right? Well, you can't quite do that in here unless you pre-compute those, 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 um, those aggregations. So any questions about the naive compression? So in general, like, MySQL does this. I think uh, MongoDB's WireTiger engine does this. A lot of different database systems do this uh, f if you're sort of trying to support general purpose workloads. For the OLAP stuff, uh, the columnar compression that we're talking about next is, is the better way to go, in my opinion. Right? It's less computational overhead, and then you can still, again, operate directly on compressed data. All right, so, so another key thing to, to point out is sort of related to that, can you, can you operate directly on the compressed data, is that if the predicates that are in your query are compressed the same way that your data is compressed, then you don't have to do any decompression. So let's show an example here. Let's say we have a database that has two tuples, has a name and salary, and then we have some, some query here. We want to find all the users where the name equals Trump. So if we compress our table here, and I'm not going to say what this compression scheme is. Let's say we're just doing attribute level compression, right? Uh, if we rewrite our query to now say, instead of name equals Trump, name equals the compressed or encoded value of what Trump used to be, then we can do our lookup directly on this data without having to do any decompression. So let's say we didn't have an index. We had to do a sequential scan. We don't need to go down to every single attribute and, de and decompress it one by one to see whether we match. Right? We just look for the thing equals xx. We find that. Then we do whatever it is we need to do to, re to reverse and decompress the encoded value to get back the original value, and poof, and th there we have our answer. Right, this is why you, can, you can't do this if you're doing the block level naive compression scheme, because you have to decompress everything 
uh, and you can't do this, this kind of like mapping from the queries predicate to the encoded value. So this is what I mean by trying to exploit the, the semantics or being able to leverage the fact that we can compress our predicates, the constants in our predicates, in the same way that the data is compressed and not have to do a bunch of extra work. All right, so now we're going to talk about all these different columnar, columnar compression schemes. Uh, and I'm do, I'll do my best to sort of say where it's called different things in different systems, right? So sometimes it's called, uh, you know, bitmap encoding, bit vector encoding, right? Uh, delta encoding, value encoding. And so I'll try to tell you what, when they're the, you know, when they're called different things, but they, but they mean the same thing. Um, but for the most part, these are all examples of compression schemes that are used in the major data warehouse systems, right, that are available today. So we'll go through each of them one by one and sort of look at some key examples. We'll spend most of our time talking about dictionary encoding, because that's, in my opinion, that's the most important one, and that's the one that's used the most often. Okay, so another thing I want to point out too also is we've already sort of talked about some of these ideas earlier when we talked about OLAP indexes for, for SQL Server. Right, remember we talked about doing dictionary encoding, value encoding, and run length encoding in, in these special indexes that SQL Server was, was going to add. So the key thing to understand about what we're going to talk about today versus what we talked about before is the earlier stuff was a sort of an extra copy of the data that was stored in a columnar format that, which could then be compressed using the techniques we'll talk about here. Right, this is also called the fractured mirrors approach. So you had your original row data, the primary storage of the database was always in this row format, and then you made an extra copy of it in, as in columns, and then you applied whatever d additional compression that you wanted. And in the paper you guys read, originally that was just a read-only uh, copy of the database, but in the newer versions they can have, they can switch to entirely column storage database. So a lot of the same ideas that we're talking about are the same, but now we're talking about compressing the primary storage location of the data rather than a secondary copy. And therefore, we need to be a little bit mindful about what do we do when we actually update things, whereas in, in the SQL Server case, it was completely read-only. But many of the same things we'll talk about are, are, are still applicable here. All right, so the first compression technique is called uh, null suppression. And the basic idea here is that you have a, um, with the, in, in a single attribute, or mostly in, in columns, you have these... Uh, these attributes that are, that are always null or missing or, or zero. And so rather than storing each individual zero, you just store sort of a run length encoding kind of thing where you say, I have 20 zeros starting at this point, um, and that's the only information you need to store rather than every single element. So this is really useful for tables that are really wide, meaning they have a lot of attributes, and where those attributes are usually empty or very sparse. Can anybody give an example of like w an application that would have a database that look looks like this? There's one sort of canonical example that's always been that's always used for something like this. So log processing is is a is a key one that does this. So like the sort of go-to use case for HDFS, like the Hadoop file system, has always been like store your logs in there, and then you have some your map produce job come over through and process them. But you can actually store them in a in a relational database as well, and what you end up doing is you just have these, for all the different events that can occur in a log message, that is basically another, another attribute or column in, in your table. So if you have all these different subservices that, that it's running your application and you're generating different types of logs, some log messages will have some attributes, some log messages will have another attributes. And so most of the time, across the entire tuple, most of the elements are going to be empty or null. And so that's when you would use null suppression because then you, for a single tuple, you wouldn't have to store, or if within a single column, you wouldn't be storing all this, you know, junk data that you don't need at all. Yes? Does this mean uh, if you use a scheme, your tuples are no longer So his question is, if you use null suppression, does this mean your tuples are no longer fixed length? So the way you would, I should have drew a diagram, the way you normally would implement this is you have, like, it's sort of like run length encoding where you would say, you know, within a single column, I have, you know, 20 nulls followed by maybe a one followed by another 100 nulls, right? So the, we're doing this in, in, as a DSM in columns, so we don't need to worry that across a single tuple that's fixed length, it's the values within the column are fixed length. And so in this case here, yes, it, it, you wouldn't be able to jump to an offset 
uh, and and get to the you know exactly what the value should be, you have to do a little little extra work to figure out at offset a thousand what should the value be, and you can have sort of like bookmarks or ways to jump to a location in your null suppression data set to say like all right I'm at offset of, you know ninety nine hundred ninety nine, it's I don't have to scan everything that came before that I know how to get to the, the thousandth offset real quickly. But that's a good question though. And so this is uh, so the null suppression stuff is related to the run length of coding. We've already talked about this, so there's not really much to say else. But basically, again, the same idea is that you're going to set a storing every single value over and over again. You can just store a, a triplet that says, at this offset, I have this value, and it's repeated X number of times. Um, and so the way you get the way to get really good uh, compression ratio if you're using run length encoding is that you have to sort the columns in such a way that you can maximize the, the compression opportunities. So like, if you have a, a table that has a column on with the sex of a student, if you sort the table based on whether it's male or female, then now instead of having to store you know, one million males and one million females, you just store you know, two triplets. Right? And that gives amazing, amazing compression. And so what was, the reason why I bring up run coding again, even though we've already talked about it, is that what we're going to be able to do in some of the later schemes is actually is apply run length encoding again to already compressed data. So we'll compress the data once using one scheme, and then we can use run length encoding or another compression scheme to compress it even more, which is kind of cool. All right, so we also talked about bitmap, encoding, bitmap coding. And again, the basic idea is that for every unique value within an attribute, we will have a bitmap vector. Uh, and then for a particular position in the, in the bitmap, that corresponds to an offset in, in our table. And if the value is one for a particular bitmap, then we know that the tuple has that value. And again, we talked about how it, this only really works if the cardinality of the different values for the attribute is low. Right? If I have a million, value, a, million, a million different values for a million tuples, then I would have to have a, you know, a one million by a million matrix for my bitmaps. And that would be, you know, that would be more space than it would be just to actually store the raw data, right? So you have to be careful, obviously, when when you choose to use bitmap compression, um, that you're not you're not end up wasting space. Okay, so now we talk about some some new schemes. So the first one is called delta encoding, and the basic idea of this is that within a particular column or particular attribute, we're going to store the difference for one value. From the difference from the value that came that preceded it in the attribute, right? And so then we only need to store that delta and not have to store the original value. So in, in this example here, I have a table that has say we're taking measurements from a sensor. We have a time and we have a temperature. So the time goes up by one minute every time we take a new measurement, and we just store the temperature here. So what you can see is that we're storing twelve, you know, twelve o'clock, twelve o one, twelve o two, twelve o three, twelve o four. And so there's not much variance in, in the time here. And likewise, for the most part, our temperature is not going to be you know, varying greatly from one measurement to the next, right? Because otherwise, like a bomb blew off or something significant happened. Most of the time, it's not going to be like that. So the numbers will be pretty close to each other. So what we'll do is we'll take the first value in our attribute and we'll store that in its, in its original form. But then all the subsequent values will be what the difference is for one particular tuple with the, with the one that came before it. So in this case here, 1201 is just one minute later, so we store plus one. And then 1202 is one minute later than 1201, so we store plus one there. Same thing for temperature, right? We store the original value, and then we can go minus one, minus, plus one, plus one, minus two, right? So now instead of having to store maybe a 64-bit timestamp and you know, a 64-bit float or whatever this is, uh, we can store this, you know, like an eight-bit, eight-bit eight integer, right? And now again, obviously, to get if we're at this particular offset, if we want to know what the what the the value is, we have to start from this point and you know decompress it by adding one all the way down, all right? So now you could store uh, you could store instead of you know plus one, plus one, plus one, and you could store plus two to say that from the, from the base value here, here's how to get to the, original, you know, to the original one, rather than having to do the daisy chain thing of going with every, adding one to every single value that came before it. The reason why you, you usually don't do that is because uh, most of the times in an OLAP database, you don't care about the exact value from one entry. Right? You're going to do the scan anyway, so you might as well go across and, and just add one as you go along. 
and save the space. Because what happens if now it's like a plus 10,000, because you have 10,000 entries, then that can't be stored in a bit integer anymore, right? So they typically always do it from, from some base value here. So the next thing to point out is for this delta here, uh, we had nothing but plus ones over and over again, right? Our time's always increasing, so it's always going to be nothing but plus ones. So this is where we can apply run length coding again, now to only store the, 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 you know, the pair that says this is the value plus one, and it's repeated four times. Right? We still keep the temperature in, in its original delta encoding form. Right? So this is an example of combining different compression schemes to get even better compression than you would just by itself. Yes? Because uh, all our queries anyway scan that bad table. Mm -hmm. uh, what about OLTB? Like, do you not do any coding? Or? Yeah, we'll talk about it at the end. You yeah, typically do not do compression on tuples in an OLTB database. Because if, you, if you're doing a transaction, right, and I got to jump to the 1,000th entry, mm -hmm. now I got to scan all this crap and re a real value. I'm, 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 I'm doing this while I'm holding locks and latches. That's terrible, right? Yeah. So you don't do this kind of encoding, or you don't do any encoding? You pretty much don't do any encoding. The, I guess the one they mentioned in the paper seems fun. Hyper? No, oh, you're no, dictionary encoding? Yeah. Uh, did you, I mean, did you, did you read the paper carefully? I think so, yeah. Uh, so when they talk about updating the dictionary, that's a big, oh, that's yeah, a big problem. Do, okay. Yeah. The way, so the, we'll talk about this later in the semester. The way, like, HANA does this is everything, all new data is always first goes in an uncompressed row store, mm -hmm. and then over time it gets, as it gets colder, then you can flip it to a column store, and then you can flip it even further to compress it, right? In like Vertica, Vertica is not a, a hybrid system; it's just purely an OLAP system. They have an uncompressed, write optimized store where all new updates go in first, and then there's a background process to then merge it and compress it with the regular data. When you want to put new data in, you always put it in uncompressed form. Right, because updating the dictionary, in, like, like it did in that paper, is a big pain in the ass. Right, yes? So, the wrong encoding on the original data deduplicates the values itself. So, the, que so the question is, does the... No, 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 so I just, like, that's true, right? Like, so the... I, I didn't hear what you said, sorry. Oh, so the run-length encoding on the original data deduplicates yes. the values themselves. And then the run-length encoding on the compressed data deduplicates, like, the derivative? Correct, yes. So, so, so the question is like, so in this example here, I'm doing run length encoding on all the already delta encoded data, right? You could do run length encoding on the, on the original data as well, right? So let's say instead of 12, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, if I had, you know, five 12 o'clocks from different sensors or whatever, I could then uh, do, do run length encoding on that. Well, they should all be zeros then, so they should be good because the, the delta will be zero. Yes, but like, yes. But still, you can do wrong encoding on that. But is that actually a pattern that occurs? Like, you have updates that like, look really similar to each other over and over again? Oh, absolutely, absolutely yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I mean, again, sensor data is the classic example. Everyone takes, at one second, take a new measurement, right? And then you have, I have a thousand sensors. They're all, it's all going to be the same. So the question is, is this pattern occur often? And the answer is yes, right? The log is another one I get, right? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Any questions? Okay. Uh, an extension or, or a different variation of delta encoding is called incremental encoding. And the basic idea here, this is use this for like you know, var chars and strings, is where you're going to be able to identify when you have common prefixes for, for your different attribute values, and then you want to store the how many elements or characters of the previous entry you can reuse for, the, for your current entry, and then you just store the suffix part that's actually different. Right? So let's say here I have, uh, I have four, four entries, uh, four, four values, nab, nabbed, nabbing, and nabbit. So the first thing I'm going to do is compute the common prefix from one entry to the next. So in the very beginning for this first guy here, nab, there's nothing that came before it, so I just keep a marker that says this is, the first, this is my base value. Then I go to the next guy, nab, and I want to say, well, what part of nab is, can be found in the beginning of nabbed? And it's obviously the first three characters, so I would store it my, as the, my common prefix as that. And you do this down the line for each one going, going with the guy above it. So then now, when I, when I compress the data, I then store two, two pieces of information. The first is going to be the prefix length to say how many, 
characters in the guy that came before me can I reuse? And then the, the second part is the suffix that would be the unique portion of the value that wasn't found in, in my predecessor. So in this case here, the first element is, 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 is the base value. We have zero, and then we have the full value. And then in, um, for nabbed, we take the first three characters, but then we have BED as, as the suffix, right? And we have to do this. This only works if, you have, if the values are sorted. And we'll see in, when we talk about dictionary encoding, actually inside the dictionary, we can actually apply this incremental uh, encoding to get even better compression ratio as well. And again, this has the same challenges that the, the delta encoding does. Is like, if I want to get the exact value for this element here, I got to know how to you know, reverse all the other ones. So this is m primarily used for, uh, you know, for, for doing OLAP stuff. All right, so another technique is it's called mostly encoding. Uh, and this is, comes from Amazon Redshift. And this is not really anything special. Uh, right? Maybe instead of encoding, it should be called mostly uh, compression. The, the basic idea is that if you have an attribute in your table where most of the values are going to be smaller than the max value that's, that is defined for the type, then you can store it in a, as, as a, with less space. And anything that does that deviates or anything that is actually bigger than what the compressed version it is, you would store that in a, in a, in a special table on the side. So let's say that my original table has uh, a column that's defined as a 32-bit integer. And I have six attributes, five attributes. And most of them are less than the 32 bits. But I had this one guy here set at 10,000. He's much larger. So I can define this to be mostly 8, meaning most of the, the values for this attribute will be 8 bits. So I can store them all as, as small ints, or I guess tiny ints. Um, and then for the one guy that, that exceeded the, the, the max value for an 8-bit eight integer, I'll store that on, on a side table here, where I keep track of the offset and what the original value was. Right? So in the case I actually do a sequential scan and I come across this marker or whatever this is, I know I need to go look up in here and find, find it. Right? So this is not doing anything special like, in terms of like, encoding like the schemes we've seen. This is basically just saying, oh, well, I recognize that most of the time I don't need the full 32 bits to store these values, so I'll store it as a lower thing. So obviously this sucks. Like if, if most of your values exceed the, the minimum and you end up having to always look in the side, the side table here, your, your performance is going to get worse. Um, I don't know how many other database systems actually database systems implement this, but this is this is actually something used in uh, Amazon's Redshift, which I think is kind of cool. All right, so now let's talk about dictionary compression. So again, we've already talked about uh, dictionary encoding, dictionary compression when we talked about SQL Server's columnar indexes, but now we need to actually go a little bit deeper and actually understand how you actually implement it. Um, and the main thing that we avoided last time is actually how you do the decoding and encoding and actually how do you, you represent uh, everything. So as I said before, I think dictionary encoding is the most important and then it's definitely the most pervasive compression, compression scheme used in uh, OLAP database systems. As far as I know, every single major commercial um, column store database system is going to support dictionary compression. So the key thing we need to be able to do is we need to support the fast encoding and decoding, right? Take an original value, compress it to create a compressed value, and decompress it. And then we also need to support range queries. This is something we didn't really talk about before, but if we have a dictionary, if we you know, implement our dictionary as a hash table, we're not going to be able to do range queries and other kinds of similar operations, prefect searches. And we're going to be no better than just you know, having to do a sequential scan all the time and decompress everything. So it's very important that we, 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 we were able to do this. So some of the questions we want, to, we want to consider as we go along is, when do we construct the dictionary? When do we actually look at their values and compress them and compute our dictionary table? And then we talk about what the scope of the dictionary is going to be, meaning at sort of the same thing we talked about in the granularity in the beginning, like what sh how much data should, the, should be encompassed in a single dictionary? We talk about how we're going to allow for range queries, and then how we can enable the fast and decoding, encoding and decoding um, that, that we're going to need. All right, so for the first issue we have to deal with is, is when do we actually construct the dictionary? So the easiest way to do this is just compute the dictionary for the entire segment of data all at the same time. Right? So you can think of this like if you, if you load, bulk load a bunch of information to your database, 
you'll stop the world, scan everything, and compute your dictionary. Um, and then any time you have new information come in, you don't want to update the existing dictionary. Uh, you want to put the new tuples in either a, a separate dictionary that, that's different, but would, would still have unique values from the first one, or you need to, need to do a rescan on the entire data set again and recompute the entire dictionary all over again. Okay? The second approach is to support what I'll call incremental updates to the dictionary. And this is where as new updates come in, then we want to add them to our dictionary uh, on the fly, which may cause the values, the encoded values, the compressed values of, of, our, of our data to change. And therefore, we have to go back and now update the tuples to, to change their old values to the new one based on our new compression scheme. Right? So there's sort of no, no one way is better than another. They all have uh, trade-offs. Um, I don't, actually don't know what the different database systems actually use. I, th I think Vertica does this one, and I don't know about Redshift and the other guys. Right? The issue is, again, do you pay this penalty of having to spend a lot of computation overhead to recompute the entire dictionary, or do we do it on the fly and update things that we've already we set before? Related to the granularity stuff at the beginning, we can also have different scope of our dictionary. Right? We can have a dictionary for an di individual block. Uh, we have a, a, comp uh, a for all the tuples within a table or across a single attribute. Um, but what's actually kind of cool with dictionary coding is you also, also can have uh, a dictionary correspond to multiple tables. So you, let's say you have a foreign key uh, reference from one table to another. Those two columns are always going to have the same distribution of values. Or not distribution, they always have the same set of values. right? Because the foreign key child cannot have a value that doesn't map to the parent. So rather than having two dictionaries set up for both of these two attributes, in, in two separate tables, they can share a single dictionary uh, and get you know and re have reduced overhead and reduced space from from that, and that's going to help us speed up joins and set operations like unions and things like that um, that you would get not be able to get over other dictionary schemes. Oops, sorry, dictionary encoding is also kind of cool because it allows you uh, allow you to do multi attribute encoding. Um, so let's say that I have a table that has two columns, value one, value two. Rather than doing dictionary encoding across one single column separately, in, uh, one by one, I can compute a single dictionary that combines the two values for both of these columns and now store a single column that has the compressed value for, 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 for both of them. Right, so I have now one dictionary that can encompass two different, different columns. And the reason why this, is, this makes sense, this is kind of cool, because uh, if you have values that are correlated with each other, um, but they're always going to be you know, roughly the same, then you can use way less space to, to represent both of them. The only issue is I don't actually know any database system that, that, that implements this approach. Like it shows up in the, in the literature, shows up in the papers, uh, but as far as I know, nobody actually does this because it's hard to identify this automatically uh, when you have these correlations, when you actually can do this. Right? Your DBA can spend a lot of time trying to fig figure this out, but uh, it's kind of the pain in the ass. And, and do you, so you can approximate this by concatenating columns together, uh, but that's sort of changing the application schema. So again, this is kind of cool, but nobody actually does this. All right, so our dictionary needs to support encode and decode. Again, it's pretty straightforward. Encode takes the original value, produces the compressed value, decode does the reverse of that. So the key thing to understand is that we're going to have to use some kind of data structures to, to, to do these operations, right? There's not going to be a magic hash function that's available to us that's going to be able to do this two-way uh, decode and encode and decode, right? You can kind of think of like, oh, I, you could use like an encryption function to do this kind of coding, but that would be computationally expensive, and it's likely that the encrypted uh, version of the thing you, you, you pass through the function is going to be larger than the original value, right? So we need a succinct way of actually representing this. I mean, we're going to have to use two different data structures. The key thing, though, is that we want our dictionary of, our, of encoded values to preserve the order of, of the original values. So what I mean by that is like, if we sort the original values in, in a certain way, like lexicographical sorting, we want the encoded values to end up with the same sort order. Right? This is going to be important to do the range of previous queries that, that we want to support. So let's look at an example here. Let's say I have a table. 
that has one column on name and it has three, three attributes, Trump, Joy, Andy, and Truman. So what I want is that when I compress the data in my dictionary, I'm going to sort it based on the, the values of the, of the, of the, or the, the, values of the, of the original data, and then they're going to have codes that are then correspond to their sort order. So that even though now the data is not going to be sorted here based on that ordering because it's, this is sort of, this is the dictionary, this is the real, the real data, it still preserves that, that the order that I, that, that I specified in the dictionary. So now if I have a query that's something like this to say select star from users or name like TRU and then the wildcard, if I don't have the, uh, if I'm not preserving the order of the original data, I would have to do a sequential scan across every single element here and decompress them one by one in order to access this, ex execute this query. But because I'm preserving the order, what I'll end up doing is I can first go through the, 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 the dictionary and do using like a binary search, find the upper bound and lower bound of the value that I'm trying to look up in, in my query and find their code. And then I can rewrite the query now to be, instead of being the like, can be between 30 and 40. So then I can do my scan in here and just find the actual attributes I, I need without having to decompress anything. Is this clear? So this only works, for this particular example, only works if the wild card is like in the middle, if it's, or sorry, at the end or the beginning. If it's in the middle, then you've got to do more, more work looking in the dictionary to find, to find that thing you're looking for. So let's look at some other queries uh, that are similar to this using this compressed data, data scheme and see whether we can operate directly on the dictionary or whether we still need to execute on the, access the, the compressed data. So our first query is going to be select name from users were named like TRU. So the difference here, instead of saying select star, now I'm, I'm only getting the name attribute. So my question is, can I operate this directly on the dictionary data, or do I need to go through and look through the compressed column as well? So what would happen for this query? What, what do we need to do? What did I just say, right? We, we have TRU followed by a wall card. So we're going to go find our upper bound and lower bound in here, right? And this is the dictionary. This is not the real data yet. So now I have 30 and 40. Do I need to go scan the data as well? Why? Exactly right. I don't. I have to support the sequential scan because I don't know how many trumps there are. Hopefully only one, but whatever. Uh, so, all right, so, so related to this, now I have select distinct name, right? Do I need to look, do I, can, can I just do this in the dictionary? Right, yes, we only have to access this because we only need to care about we've, we, whether we have an existence of the value, not whether how many there are. Yes? You assume there's never a delete or that if you have a delete, it's also in the dictionary. So this question is, are we assuming that there's no deletes or that, or, or that if we have deletes, that they're reflected in the dictionary. Right. The, the answer is yes. So I'm not really going to talk about uh, consistency in, in, in the index here. Uh, but you can imagine that the same curve stuff that we talked about before applies to the index as well. Right? The same stuff you guys are doing in the BW tree to make sure you have a consistent index. Uh, we have to do this in, in here. Um, in the paper you guys read, the way they get around this is they lock the entire table anytime you do any modifications on it. But you can imagine there's, there's more sophisticated things you can do to make, make this work. Again, we're, thinking, we're coming to this from the OLAP world, so like we're doing bulk loads every I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, hour, a day. And we can lock the entire thing while, while we do that. And then we can do our, 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 all our queries doing it in a lock-free manner. So this is different than the HTAP stuff where we need to be able to, be, to, uh, you know, to update the database at the same time. And this is why, again, they don't, do, they don't do any compression on the hot data that just got inserted because then you have to lock all these auxiliary data structures and it's going to be slow. Whereas we know how to do, again, a latch free B, B plus tree. Right? We know how to do all that real fast now uh, on, on, on the, the OLTB data structures. But doing updates for this thing is difficult. There's a question in the back or no? Okay. All right, so again, what I'm pointing out here is there's sort of like you have all this extra data, 
as it's in the dictionary, and the database system can exploit it and avoid having to do look, look at the entire thing for certain types of queries. And just in the same way that we could then, if we rewrite, rewrite our query just to operate directly on the encoded values, we don't have to decompress everything one by one. Right? We can only find the attributes we needed based on, based on the encoded values. And then when we produce the final answer to the terminal or to the application, to the client, then we actually do, do the decompression. Right? We delay the decompression as far as long as possible. All right, so how are we going to actually implement our hash table? Or sorry, our, our dictionary. So we could use a hash table, right? The hash table is kind of nice because it's, it's, it's fast, it's compact, right? We do 01 lookups. Um, the problem, though, with the hash table is that you're going to lose that order preserving guarantee that we, we want, right? If we hash the values, we have no way of, of unless we maintain additional metadata about the sort order of the, of the hash keys, we have no way to go, you know, go to the range queries that we want. With the B plus tree or any kind of you know, tree index, it's going to be slower than a hash table and it's going to definitely use more memory, but it's going to satisfy our, our range and prefix queries that we need. And that's essentially that we, we're going to make a decision to choose this over this. And this is what they used in the paper. But the thing that they, the guys in the paper did that I think is very novel is that rather than having two completely independent data structures for the, the encoding and decoding, they can allow them to share the leaves of, of the two trees uh, where most of the data is stored anyway. And you, that way you can do both two-way lookups on, on, in either direction. So this is an example of what they were talking about. Right, so you have. On the top, we'll have our encode index, and the bottom will be the decode index. And again, this could be any tree structure you want, a BW tree, a P plus tree, it doesn't matter. Um, and then in the middle here, we're going to have our sorted share leaves. And so in this case here, we'll have our values, and be sorted in like graphical order, and they will have some, you know, some, some codes identified to them. And these are the codes that are stored in the actual column in the table heap. So now we get the original value in. We would then traverse the encoded index, and we would come to this leaf, and then we could do binary search directly inside of this to find the code that we want, and then we can spit that out to whatever, whatever part of the query engine needs it. Same way for the encoded value, right? When we come down here, since the codes are still, are still sorted as well, right, because they correspond to the sort order of, of the values, we just do binary search again and find the value that we want and then produce it out to the, to the query engine, right? So the key thing to point out here is that by organizing these, the, the data into leads, potentially makes it easy to do uh, incremental updates without having to modify the, the codes for everybody else in, in the in index. So let's say that if I set up these, my code values being in, 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 in you know, ranges, so let's say this guy handles from, from you know, 10 to 100, and this guy handles from 900 to 999, then I could insert a new value here change the sort order for, for all these potentially, which may cause them to get new values. But then when I go to update now the actual columns with, with the sort of the compressed values, I don't have to redo everybody over here. I only have to re redo the ones here, right? So this is what sort of paper talks about, like how do you handle all this in an efficient manner? And they don't really say that one way is better than another. They just say if you actually need to implement uh, you know, a shared leaf dual index for encoding and decoding, Here's, the, here's different things you have to consider. So another thing to point out is we have these, these leaves with these values and code mappings. This is already sorted for us. Right? Obviously, it has to be because that's how we define the, the how, it's how we preserve the ordering. So what compression scheme can we use for the shared leaves here that we've already talked about before? What's that? Yeah, so what was the prefix encoding scheme? What's that? No, close. Incremental encoding, right? Because these are all, these are all strings. We could just store the prefix that, that that we have from the previous guy, and then the suffix of what's different. All right. So not only will we have a compressed column now with our dictionary encoded values, but because this thing has to sit in memory too, we want to compress this as, as much as, as much as possible as well. Right? And we'll talk about in a second how do you actually compress this part. So any questions about dictionary encoding? It's the, again, it's the most common one, handling updates uh, for on, on, on the fly is difficult and there's ways to sort of handle this. It's better off to do it in bulk. And you may have to go back and update your, your existing values. Yes? 
the statement is, or question is, is this only beneficial for variable length fields? No. Why do you say that? Or maybe not variable length fields, but like uh, bar chars or things like that. So the statement is, this is only useful for like bar chars or like blobs. blobs. Um, no, right? So let's say I have, uh, I have, you know, you can imagine you have, you, have a, you have an attribute that has 32 bit numbers, but I, I, I have a billion tuples, but they only have three numbers, three different values. So a dictionary encoding would, would compress that really well as well. Right? You can kind of think of dictionary encoding as like a, almost like an enum in some ways as well. But it's, it's, it's dynamically handled to you by the database system rather than the application level. But the, the ordering stuff you get out of it is. Uh be less beneficial for those sorts of things. The statement is the order preserving benefits you get from the dictionary encoding is less beneficial for other other the example I gave. Um, yeah, I, I mean I, I'm sure I could sit and think of an example where like yeah you do, you do want to do dictionary encoding on integers and you do need order preserving stuff. So I tell you, like in uh, DB2 Blue and uh, or I mean DB2 Blue and um, SAP HANA, they dictionary code everything. Doesn't matter what the attribute is, they use dictionary coding it for it. Right? They're very aggressive about it, and you get the space savings is quite significant. So okay. All right. So now let's switch gears for a little bit in the remaining time we have. So everything I just talked about, as I said, sort of related to his question. It's awesome, but can't really use it for OLTP because the cost of, of updating these things, maintaining it as the database is changing, is going to be really bad. And we want to be able to support fast asset access and fast modifications in the middle of a transaction. If we're holding locks in our transaction and we have to go recomputer dictionary, that's terrible because that's basically stopping the world. So we, we need to find a, a, another source of data that we can compress to reduce the overhead of, 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 our, of, our, of our, the amount of storage we have of our database in memory. So it turns out in OLTP databases, indexes consume like a, a, a sizable portion of the amount of data that's stored in memory. Right? And so these are actually measurements we did for, um, for in our in-memory database HStore for three, three different OLTP benchmarks. And so with the first column is this is the percentage of memory that's used for storing tuples, and then the percentage of memory used for primary indexes and secondary indexes. So if you add these numbers up here, you can see that the, it ranges from about 35 to almost 60 percent of, of, of the data is spent doing indexes, or, or is, is used just for the indexes. Um, the article's workload is, is sort of modeled after Reddit, so it's like, you know, it's like people posting comments and, and on, 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 on posts. Uh, so those have like, you know, large text fields, so that's why the percentage is much lower. Um, in these kind of data sets, it's like you're storing order processing information or, or, or like online polling and things like that. And so that's why the, those index percentages are higher. So figuring out how we can compress the indexes is, it makes sense, and this is something we, we, we've been looking into. And so what we've, we've been working on is something called hybrid indexes. And the basic idea of a hybrid index is that we're going to take a single logical index. So what I mean by logical is like when you call create index, right, or you declare a primary key, that's a logical index. And then we're going to store that logical index, or we're going to maintain it using two different physical data structures underneath the covers. So from you as the application programmer writing SQL queries, you see one, one index, but underneath the covers we, we really have two. And then these two different data structures uh, will have different characteristics that can exploit how the data is actually being used and can allow us to compress one and not the other. So we'll split these data structures up into what we'll call stages. So we'll have the di dynamic stage where all new data is going to come in if we first store it, and it's going to be allow us to do the fast updates that we've, we've, we've been talking about all before. Like this could be a BW tree, a B plus tree, a skip list, it doesn't matter. And then we'll have a static stage where we'll migrate data as it gets cold from the dynamic stage to the static stage, and we'll have a compressed read-only data structure that is, is significantly uh, less space to store than the dy dynamic side. So to show a diagram what this looks like, so let's say we have our dynamic index, and that's going to be small, and the static index is going to be something that's very big but compressed. 
So all, all inserts update leads always have to hit the dynamic index. Even if, the, even if we're doing an update on something that's stored in the static index, we'll always mark it here in, in the, the dynamic index. Likewise, if we do a delete, then we just store that we deleted the thing here and don't update the static index until later on when we do the merge. Because over time, what will happen is when this thing gets full and the data gets cold, we'll move things over here and rebuild the, the static side. So now when we do a read, we always first hit a bloom filter that will tell us whether the element that we're looking for is in the, the dynamic side or not. Because right? the bloom filter can give you false positives, but not false negatives. Right? So it would tell us that, yes, it's in here, and therefore we should go look. Um, and if it's not, you know, if it's a false positive, then we'll go check the static side. If it comes back and says it's not in there, then we just go do a push our read over here. Right? So it's a little more tricky than what I'm describing here because, you know, I, it matters whether this is a unique index or this is a non-unique index. It matters whether the read is a scan versus uh, a point query. Right? If you do a scan, you actually have to scan both of them at the same time. Right, you're paying a little computational overhead, or overhead to maintain these two separate indexes, but it's going to allow us to get uh, significant space savings. So let me show you how, how, a, we, how we actually generate a compact index. So, I'm going to take a, so we have basically a formula of different techniques. You can apply to any different kind of data structure you want. Skip list, the radex tree from Hyper, B plus tree, uh, possibly the BW tree. We haven't tried it yet, though. Um, and there's a bunch of rules that we're going to apply to these data structures to allow us to compress them and, and reduce the amount of space that they're, they're using. So let's say that we have our, our, our B plus tree, and we just load a bunch of data in, and it sort of gets laid out like this. So the first thing to point out is that there's all these empty slots within the nodes of the B plus tree, because remember, the B plus tree has to be at least half full, but on average, it's like 69% full. So what we want to do is we want to get rid of this, because this is just wasted space. We always have to allocate the space, because we never know when we're actually going to have to store something in it. So because we're static, because we're read-only, we know nothing's ever going to be stored in here, so we can go ahead and just get rid of that. Now we can compact it down. Right, so that's the big space savings. Then the next piece is that we have all these pointers here. Right? We, it's a B plus tree, so we have pointers to get back and forth along the leaf nodes, and then we have pointers from the root node to get down to the, the, the leaves here. But again, we're static. We don't really, we're never going to have to update this thing. We're never going to have to move our, our, the location of these, of these nodes in memory. So instead of sorting pointers, what we'll do is we'll just combine all the leaves into a giant array. And then we'll have, uh, keep track of where our different levels are in the tree. And we know how to compute for a particular offset in one of the arrays, how to jump into a location in the lower levels here. Right, so here we got rid of pointers and we got rid of empty slots. And now you see why this is read only because if I have to insert, say, element 20 here, then that's going to mess everything up because I have to reallocate things and shuffle things around. Right, so we're going to do bulk loading of data when we, when we, when we create the, the static side. So to give you an idea of what kind of space savings we can get, so this is uh, the original B plus tree, the SDX B plus tree, and our hybrid B plus tree. So we have the SDX B plus tree on the dynamic side, and then our compact B plus tree on the static side. And we're going to run a uh, simple workload of doing 50% reads, 50% writes on a data set with 50 million entries. And the three data sets we are using random integers, monotonically increasing integers, and then the email list from the Ashley Madison website, um, which is available online. So what you basically see here is because um, it's not a comparison against the static side versus the dynamic side. The hybrid is going to have both. So this is why the performance is, is going to be better uh, for the hybrid index, because our dynamic index is going to be significantly smaller, and therefore traversing it, uh, the, the compact B plus tree, is much faster than doing the dynamic version. And we also can see here that the, we get um, the size of the index is significantly less than, than the other one. Right? In this case here, we almost get about almost a gigabyte back. And this is half the size for the, the monotonically, increasing index, or monotonically increasing integers. Uh, so we're not paying any performance penalty for this particular workload. And other workloads are different. But then we're getting our space savings. So now you, you can think of like a, a large OTP application that has a lot of indexes. If you're saving you know, a gigabyte per index, that's a lot of tuples. That's a lot of data. And you have no performance impact because, again, it works just like any other OHP index because you always hit the dynamic side. And then as things get colder, you can migrate it to, to the static side. 
So any questions about this? Again, this is not published yet. This is, this is stuff that we, uh, we're, we're, pu we're putting out later this year. And it's currently only implemented in HStore, and eventually we hope to get this into Peloton, maybe l later in the year. OK. So what are my parting thoughts? Uh, again, I can't stress this enough. Dictionary encoding is probably the most important compression scheme because um, it doesn't require any pre-sorting. And like you have to do run length encoding and other schemes. And you can still do random access directly at single tuples if you want to. Uh, the how you actually handle updates, though, is kind of tricky. And this is why most of the database systems do this in bulk or do this offline or on the side and not try to do update the dictionary on the fly. And we also saw how the database system can uh, combine different approaches, uh, uh, compressing them one after another, and get, better, get a better compression ratio with minor overhead. Um, and then we also talked about how it's really important to wait as long as possible as you execute a query plan to actually decompress the data. Ideally, you want to wait to the very end when you actually, actually have to produce the answer to get back to the application. If you can wait that long, uh, then you're pretty good. So any questions about compression? OK. So next class on Monday, well, I'll spend some time talking about doing query planning, query optimization. Uh, and then we'll spend a little bit of time at the end just giving some general tips for you guys to get, as you get started on project three of how do you work on a large code base, right? I've, I can speak from experience because I, I, mean, I worked on Condor when I was at Wisconsin. I worked on HDOR. I've worked on Postgres and other things like that. So you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm an expert in this, but I can sort of give you my own tips of the things that I've learned over the years to help it sort of guide you along. OK? All right, guys, we're done. See you next class. <laughs>